welcome to another Bard's Tale. The list of Thor's great accomplishments is long, a list mockingly parodied by the twisted mischief maker whose stories end often in his own suffering. Though when the suffering is not his, the burden falls to someone else, and they suffer greatly. Oftentimes it may seem that the wily trickster Loki is a harmless specter of fun-loving and innocent disposition, but he is as complex as a world which bore him. He is fathered by the giant Farbauti, and his mother was Lao Fei. Little is known of his mother. She may have been a giant, a goddess, or something else entirely. Loki himself has fathered three children by the giantess Engelboda. In previous tales we've heard of his three children. They are three creatures of terrible nature, and two of them are to be directly responsible for the deaths of some of the greatest to see come Ragnarok. His children are Hjormungand, the world serpent prophesied to slay Thor, and Thor him. Fenrir, fated to slay Odin, and his Einherjar, and finally Hel, ruler of the underworld and queen of the lost souls. As Loki begets sorrow, his children are to become his legacy to it. Loki did have other children though. Two he had with his proper wife Sigyn. One they named Vali. The other they named Nafi, a name meaning corpse. The other is a slightly stranger tale. I've mentioned before that he had fathered five children, three to Angaboda and two to Sigyn, but there was one other, a child he did not quite father, but mothered. The strange circumstances of this tale date back to the early days of Asgard, when the gods were discussing how best to fortify the upper earth. They were eventually approached by a man who claimed to be an incredible builder. He stated simply that he could complete the fortress in three seasons, but on the condition that should he stay true to his word, he would take the goddess Freya, the sun, and the moon as his payment. The Aesir fell into heated debate, some not believing he could do it, and others not willing to take the risks should they lose three of their own. But in the end, they agreed. Asgard was to be fortified by the Builder in three seasons, or there would be no payment. For surely no one could complete such a task in three seasons. The Builder understood, and asked that his stallion Svartal Fari be able to help. The Aesir were reticent, but Loki convinced them that surely even with the aid of this horse, he would still not be able to complete his task. They soon learned to regret their decision as the Builder and his stallion took to their work with ease. The stallion hauled enormous stones back to their Builder every day and night. Over time it became all too clear that the Builder would certainly finish his task in time to claim his reward. The Aesir were furious and turned on the one who had set them on this foolish path, Loki. Clearly the Builder could not have finished the work so quickly were it not for the aid of his faithful stallion. As it was his fault that the Aesir were in this situation, it fell to Loki to waylay the Builder by distracting his stallion. Should he fail in his task, and the Builder claim Freya, the Sun, and the Moon, Loki would be put to a cruel death. Loki was terrified, but as his mind raced in a desperate attempt to save himself, he thought up a plot that was sure to succeed. That night, Loki took the form of a beautiful mare and galloped away to distract the Svartalfari. Upon seeing the mare, Svartalfari tore away from the Builder, and chased the horse-shaped form of Loki. The Builder, however, became enraged, and in his anger he proclaimed he was actually a giant named Hrimthurs, one of the banished race exiled to the far reaches of the world by the gods. Immediately Thor took his hammer and smashed in the skull of the giant, killing him instantly. Time passed, and Loki eventually gave birth to a horse. A peculiar one, too, as it had eight legs. Loki's horse child would go on to be known as the best among horses, Sleipnir, and would become that great steed of Odin. Loki's tales rarely end in a boon to the gods, such as Sleipnir for Odin. Sometimes they have truly terrible consequences. One such example is his theft of the fruit of Idun. It began when Odin travelled with Loki and Hainir through the wilderness, a tangled expanse of snow-capped mountain peaks and tall, dark forests. They had travelled for a time and now struggled to find food. Marching onward, they came to a spot where grazed a large herd of oxen. 
Their stomachs rumbled, and with little more thought, they slaughtered an ox, and went about creating an earth oven to cook it in. Certain that they had made the oven perfectly well, they were all the more irritated and confused when the oxen meat would not cook. The flames licked at the flesh, but it made no difference. A voice above them drew the Asir's attention, and looking up they saw a large eagle perched in the canopy above. It was the eagle that had spoken, and he claimed that it was he who caused them grief. His magic meant the meat would never cook. Were he allowed his fill of meat, however, he may be inclined to lift the spell. The Asir were left with few options, and so grumbled in agreement that the eagle could eat. The eagle flew down beside them and claimed the best portions of the ox. Loki became furious. This was not in the terms of their bargain, and so he lifted a sturdy stick from the undergrowth and leapt at the eagle. The giant bird simply snatched the branch in its talons and took off with Loki still clinging on. The flight took Loki above the clouds, higher than the trees and even the mountains. In the privacy of the open air, the eagle proclaimed his name was Thiazi, and he was a giant in another form. Loki begged to be let down, but now that Thiazi had the god at a disadvantage, he demanded something of Loki. Thiazi demanded Loki take an oath that he would bring him Edun and her fruits. Edun was an Asir with a very particular and incredibly important role. She was the owner and giver of fruit. Not your average berry, apple, or nut. No. These were the fruits of immortality. Asir, unbeknownst to many, are mortal. They are born, they will age, and they will die. And were it not for Edun's fruit, this would certainly be so. But never has a god died of old age while Edun and her fruits were there to provide longevity. Loki, terrified of the death that awaited him far below, agreed to Thiazi's terms, and took the oath. Thiazi flew low and dropped Loki back to his companions, before disappearing into the sky. Loki, Odin, and Hainir returned to Asgard. While the others returned to their homes, Loki immediately went to Idun, telling her that he had found fruits even more marvelous than her own growing beyond the walls of Asgard. Adun was curious, and Loki offered to take her there. Adun would bring her fruits so they could compare hers to Loki's. But when Loki led Adun beyond the walls, she was suddenly lifted high into the air, caught in the giant talons of the eagle Thiazi. The giant eagle took the goddess to Thrymheim, a place found in the highest mountain peaks where icy towers stabbed awkwardly towards the sky. With Adun gone, there was no one to give the fruit and so the long-restrained onslaught of time began to eat at the youth of the Asir. The beautiful became sagged and wrinkled, the strong became aching and brittle, and once blonde hair turned grey. A council was called, and it was not long before the assembly turned on Loki. He was last seen with Adun as they wandered beyond Asgard's walls. The threats of torture had barely begun when Loki burst into his sobbing story. The gods cared little for Loki's plight, and threatened that should he not be able to return Edun and her fruits to Asgard, he would be put to death. Loki was stuck between two deaths, and decided the other Asir were a larger threat to him. He agreed to rescue Edun. Freya lent Loki her feather cloak, a magical thing which would allow its wearer to take the form of a hawk. Loki took flight to Jotunheim, till he came to the icy peaks of Thrymheim. Luckily for Loki, when he landed at the giant's home, Thiazi wasn't there. He had travelled down to the ocean to fish. Adun was alone within. Loki spared no time in finding Adun, and when he did he turned her into a small nut and sped away, quick as his wings would take him, back to Asgard. When Thiazi returned home, he was enraged to find his prize missing. He took to the sky, filling the air with the thunderous beating of his enormous wings as he flew towards Asgard knowing this was the work of that wily trickster. By the time Loki could be seen from Asgard, so too could the large shadow of the eagle giant Thiazi. The gap between the two was closing dangerously fast, but the Asir were prepared. Once they saw Loki and his pursuer, they built up a large pile of kindling around the fortress. They set it alight, and the flames roared high. Loki was able to get past the barrier of flames, barely in time, but Thiazi was not quick enough, and he burst into flames, crashing into the earth below. He was killed where he landed. And Loki returned Idun to her usual form, and she quickly went about giving her youth-giving fruit to the Asir. 
In little time at all, the Asir were returned to their youth, though none ever did truly forget or even forgive Loki's transgression. While Loki may have been a coward, a liar, a cheat, and a trickster, the other Asir had never thought much else of him. But his role in the death of Balder, son of Odin and one of the most beloved of the Asir, is an act none could mistake as anything but the cruelest betrayal. Balder was known as generous, kind, joyful, and courageous, and his passing was made all the more painful for it. Balder began to have ominous dreams. Each night he would dream of a grave misfortune falling upon him. What this misfortune was, he couldn't quite tell. The dreams began to disturb Balder, and so he confided in his parents Odin and Frigg about his nightly horrors. Upon hearing of their son's suffering, they turned to the other gods, who became fearful. Prophecy visits those in times only of great peril. They appointed Odin, wisest among them, to discover the meaning hidden behind the veil of Baldur's dreams. Odin rode off immediately, setting off to the underworld on Sleipnir. He travelled down the wooden ways of Yggdrasil to reach a seeress of the dead, one which could interpret his son's dreams. At the gates, he took the form of one of his countless disguises and wandered into the dark and misty depths of the dead realm. Walking through the lifeless stone fields of the underworld, the mists suddenly parted before Odin, and before him was a hall with a feast laid out before him. There the seeress he sought played about mirthfully, enjoying her magnificent feast. Odin approached her and asked her the reason for such festivity. She said she was very excited to greet the guest of honor. Odin asked who the guest of honor was to be, and to his horror she replied that it was his son. The seeress joyfully recounted the prophecy of Baldur's death, and only stopped when she saw the dark expression on the disguised man's face. She knew now that before her stood the father of the guest of honor. She stopped, and Odin walked away. On Odin's return to Asgard, he called a council. All could see the sorrow in his heart. Odin spoke of all he had seen and heard. Frigg leapt up immediately. She would not allow her son to pass when no chance had been taken on his life yet. Frigg was desperate, and in her desperation she sought about obtaining an oath of everything in the cosmos that none would ever do harm to Baldur. A mother trying to save a child is a powerful thing, and Frigg was able to get every oath. Frigg returned victorious, and spirits soared at the news. In such high spirits, the Aesir made a game of this situation. Baldur stood before them, and the other gods would throw sticks and stones, and anything else they could find at him, only to see each and every time the item of choice bouncing off his oath-protected body. Everyone laughed, and the Aesir were happy again. But the opportunity was too perfect, the idea too mischievous, for Loki to resist. He took a disguise and approached Frigg, asking her if truly all things had made the oath. Frigg laughed it off. Why, of course she had. Everything except for mistletoe, which was such a small and innocent thing that she thought little of any harm could do. Loki grinned and left to find the one thing that had not sworn to Baldur's health. With mistletoe in hand, Loki approached the blind god Hoda. He feigned sorrow for the blind Asir, stating how saddened he felt that Hoda could not enjoy the merriment of the other gods. The blind god nodded in agreement. Loki handed him the mistletoe, and offered to guide his hand as he threw it at Baldur. And so Hoda threw the mistletoe with Loki's guidance. The mistletoe pierced Baldur straight through, and the beloved god fell dead. Joy turned to horror as the lifeless body of Baldur bled on the ground. They were unable to speak in their anguish and fear. The prophecy of Ragnarok was well known to all Asir, and Baldur's death was the beginning. Before them lay not only Baldur's body, but a path of ruination and death. Their extinction was closing in. Frigg was the first to compose herself, and implored the bravest and most compassionate to step forth to retrieve her son's soul from the underworld. Hell must be bargained with for the return of her son, and to push back Ragnarok. From the crowd stood forth Odin's son, Hermod. Odin gave him sleep near, and he rode fast as he could to the underworld. In his absence, the gods arranged a lavish funeral for the fallen god. They turned to Baldur's ship, Hringhorni, 
into a pyre fit for a man of his stature. But his stature may have been greater than they had believed, because when the Asir attempted to push the boat from the sandy shore out to sea, it would not move. After many failed attempts, they called on the aid of the brawniest being in the cosmos, a giantess named Hylokin. She arrived in Asgard riding a wolf with venomous snakes for reins. She dismounted and approached the ship. She placed her shoulder against the stern of the ship and pushed. Her strength was so great and the ship so stubbornly set in the sand that the land quaked and shuddered. But Hylokin was stronger still and the ship reached the ocean. As Baldur's body was carried to the ship, Nana, his wife, was overcome with such grief that she died where she stood. Her body was lifted gently and placed on the pyre beside her husband. They set the pyre alight, and Thor hallowed the flames by holding Mjolnir over them. The Aesir were not the only ones to observe the pyre funeral. From across the nine worlds, elves, dwarves, valkyries, and others gathered to watch the departure of a great god. Far, far below, Hermod rode nine nights through deep and dark valleys till he came to the river called Gjol, and atop the bridge that crosses it, the giantess Mothgatha, guardian of the bridge. Mothgatha asked Hermod his purpose here, stating it was strange to see one so lively, and one whose footfalls are as thunderous as an entire army. Hermod answered her, telling the giantess of his story, and she let him pass. Hermod rode into the underworld Hell, and approached Hell's throne. Beside her, pale and downcast, sat Balder. Hermod spent the night there, and when morning came he implored the Queen of Hell to release his brother, telling her of the terrible prophecy which began with Balder's death. All living things would suffer otherwise. Hell agreed to release Balder, but only if everything in the cosmos wept for him. But if any refused, he was to remain in Hell. Hermod wasted no time and rode back to Asgard. Upon arrival and hearing Hermod's story, messengers were immediately sent throughout the Nine Worlds, and eventually all in the cosmos did weep for Bola. All save one, a giantess named Tok. When the messengers approached her, she responded only, Let Hell hold what she has. The messengers were horrified, but could do little else. Once they left, Tok returned to her true form as Loki. And so it was that Baldur would remain in Hell's clutches till Ragnarok. The cosmos mourned the loss of a god so great as Baldur, but in this time of sorrow, Loki found joy in mocking and slandering the Aesir whenever he had the chance. Loki had always been more burdened than help to the Aesir, and his abuse of the Aesir in a time of such great distress pushed them beyond their limits of tolerance. Loki was to be captured and put away, but Loki was cunning and learned of their plans before they could enact them, and so he ran far from Asgard to the peak of a high mountain where he built for himself a house with four doors from which you could see his pursuers from all directions. By day he would turn himself into a salmon and hide beneath a waterfall, and by night he sat by his fire weaving a net for fishing, but none could hide from the far-seeing Odin. His one eye perceived where Loki dwelt, and the Aesir left Asgard to capture him. Loki saw his pursuers from a way off, threw the net in the fire, and leapt into a stream down the mountain in the shape of a salmon. The Aesir arrived to find little evidence of their target, but surmised quickly the cunning mischief maker had probably taken the form of some inconspicuous thing. They found the net smoldering on the fire, and Kavasir, wisest among them, assumed Loki had taken the likeness of those he had intended to catch himself. The Aesir pursuers picked up the remains of the net and traveled down the mountain to the stream where Loki hid. The Aesir went about fishing with little result, until one salmon attempted to swim further downstream to reach the sea. It leapt high in the air, but before it could reach the safety of the water again, it was plucked out of the air by Thor. The salmon writhed and flicked in the Thunder God's grasp, but Thor's grip was steel on the fish's tail fin. Incidentally, this is why the salmon has a slender tail. Loki returned to his true form, and the prisoner was taken back to Asgard. Here he was taken to a cave, and before him were his two sons, Vali and Nafi. By Asir magic, Vali took the form of a wolf, 
and immediately turned on his brother Nafi, tearing out his sinews and entrails. Nafi's entrails were then used to bind Loki around his shoulders, his gut, and his knees to three large rocks, and soon as he was bound, his son's entrails became hard as iron. Then the goddess Skadi placed a poisonous snake on a rock above Loki's head, where it began to drip venom onto his face, which causes him terrible agony. His wife Sigyn could not sit by and watch her husband suffer. She took a wooden bowl and placed it above her husband to catch the snake's venom. When the bowl was full and Sigyn must empty the venom into a stone basin, the pain Loki suffers at the viper's drip is excruciating, and he can do little more than writhe in terrible agony, bound as he is. His convulsions are so great they cause earthquakes in Midgard. This is the tale of Loki and his wife Sigyn, and so is their lot till Ragnarok comes when Loki will commit his greatest betrayal of all. He will turn on the Aesir, siding with the giants to end the cosmos.